Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Homebrewers Association. If you're into big, juicy, and hazy IPAs, you're going to love this limited-time offer. Now through May 31st, use promo code ZAMBA when you join or renew your American Homebrewers Association membership to receive a quarter pound of HS Zamba hops while supplies last. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing and use promo code ZAMBA, that's Z-A-M-B-A, to claim your quarter pound of free hops and find recipes featuring this tropical and fruity hop, perfect for late kettle and dry hop additions. Get offer details at homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 12th, 2022. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby, author of the Homebrew Recipe Bible, Methods of Modern Homebrewing, and How to Brew Hard Seltzer, joins us to talk about yeast. In this installment on our, on our ongoing recipe development series, Chris gives an overview of the most important ingredient in our homebrew recipes. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Well, I said last week it'd probably be a little while until Steve Wilkes and I could get together for a video shoot, but Steve actually came up from for air, from packing, to shoot a couple of video episodes and an audio show with me yesterday. So financial supporters will get to see an early release of the first one of those this week, along with a behind-the-scenes video and a recipe for the beer. First up is a version of a Bell's Two-Hearted Clone uh, recipe. Uh, brewed with a Simcoe instead of Centennial hops, which is what's actually used in the Two-Hearted Ale. Uh, you know it's going to be delicious, but how is it different, if at all, from the standard recipe? You know, what's, what does Simcoe bring to the recipe that Centennial doesn't, and vice versa? We also shot a show on my small batch lemon custard pie experimental recipe that was inspired by Steve's comments on the last Tincture show. That one... Uh, did not come out as I planned, <laughs> but is that a good thing? <laughs> no spoilers, uh, at least not yet. Uh, Steve and I uh, recorded an audio episode featuring tinctures in a dark beer this time. It was uh, – we used a wild blueberries, mint, and toasted coconut. That was a fun one and a bit surprising on some of those ingredients. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag. Uh, listener Chris from Wisconsin wrote after hearing Casey Latillier of Ivory Bill and I talk about brewing with the perennial grain Kernza. Chris says, listen to the show on Kernza today. And tonight on Wisconsin Public TV was a show about growing Kernza and brewing. The, uh, Chris says the uh, Wisconsin brewery using it is called Driftless Brewing. Well, that's very cool. A little bit of uh, synchronicity there. Nice to know others are playing with uh, Kernza in a beer. And I sent that info to uh, Casey at Ivory Bill so he could know about that. Keith from Trail, British Columbia in Canada writes in defense of the Corona Mill. You might remember uh, <laughs> we, Casey and I kind of kind of talked talked badly about the Corona Mill uh, because he had to use one to build a Kernza. <clears throat> Keith says, I really enjoyed the Kernza story. Triple is one of my 10 favorite styles, and I look forward to the tasting notes in an upcoming episode. I wanted to let you know there is at least one brewer out there who's still using a Corona Mill these days. I got mine in the early 90s as a birthday present. The local homebrew shop owner told my partner who bought it for me, said that it would last a lifetime, and I hope to hold him to it. Uh, Keith says it may be a little harder to adjust the crush, but not $200 more difficult, so I don't have the urge to upgrade. I've never had a stuck sparge because of the mill, and I bet if you did a side-by-side -side taste test against a roller mill, you wouldn't notice a difference, but that's a different show. That might be a fun experiment. 
Uh, Keith says, when you get your Kernza, you're more welcome to come by and use our mill. <laughs> I'd love to have an excuse to go up to British Columbia. Uh, Keith also uh, says, I also enjoy the recipe development series. For me, my breakthrough came because I was trying to copy a commercial beer or two. It was Big Rock Traditional and Guinness Stout that I was trying to make so my friends could not tell the difference in a tasting using clear glasses. That meant color, clarity, aroma, and flavor had to be on point. Identifying the differences and trying to figure out what ingredient contributes to the difference brought it all together. That effort made me a better brewer. A black roasty beer with a twang and a creamy white head. Not that easy to copy when your friends drank a lot of Guinness. That's a, that's good. That's a good tip, actually. And, and Keith isn't done. Keith says, uh, also competitions helped me early on. I remember my first all-grain Pilsner that I entered in the Edmonton Homebrewers Guild competition. And the feedback was, nice beer but needs more malt. It was all malt. How could I get more? <laughs> then I found aromatic malt, and we got a medal the next year. Quality feedback is so important to help you learn and adjust your recipes. All Thanks, Keith. I appreciate that thoughtful uh, note. Excellent points all around, and, and, I, and I apologize for disparaging the Corona Mill. I've never used one myself. I just, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that you just hear over the years. Um. This week's show is about yeast, and of course we can't pass up the opportunity to talk about our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast. Casey at Imperial tells me they're extending the availability of L26 Pilgrimage through the end of May. You've heard me sing the praises of Pilgrimage because it did a great job with my passion fruit pilsner and my toasted rye doppelbach, and those were fermented at lager temps. But it's, it's warming up across the country, but it, it still may be lager season. Uh, the Brilosophy blog posted an experiment by Jake Houlihan uh, recently that compared beers fermented with Imperial L13 Global at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or 10C, and 72 degrees Fahrenheit, or 22C. Now, spoiler, uh, statistically, there was no, apparently no difference between the two. Now... That was global and not pilgrimage, but that would be a fun experiment to try with the pilgrimage as the temperatures rise with the weather. You know we love Imperial Organic Yeast. My stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore for making starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. And if I, if I pitch in the early afternoon, my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime. Ask your local homebrew shop about Imperial L26 pilgrimage through the end of May and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. Okay, let's get yeasty with Chris Colby. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. We're headed down the road talking about, still talking about ingredients, but we're, we're kind of running out of ingredients to talk about. <laughs> hmm. But we're we're saving one of, if not the most important ingredient for last, and that is yeast. Beer yeast. You can't have beer without yeast. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the show for today. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> All credits. <laughs> so arguably, uh, yeast is is the most impactful uh, ingredient, right? It, yeah, it certainly when you – on brew day, you end up with wort, you know, a sweet uh, a liquid or whatever and – or not or whatever. You end up with a sweet liquid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's cooling it down and, and pitching the yeast that then transforms that wort into beer. So, yeah, it's uh, – yeast is, is interesting as an ingredient because uh, although it's an ingredient, it doesn't end up in the final beer, at least not at any, you know, large amount – um, and, and it transforms, uh, you now it's almost in a way it's similar to a processing aid, but it's, it's, it's an ingredient. So what, what actually, what exactly goes on inside the yeast? How is it able to turn sugars uh, into alcohol? Well, the yeast cells have, uh, receptors on the outside of their, uh, cell walls that, that bring the sugars in. And then the sugars are fed through uh, the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway and the uh, um, uh, 
uh, fermentation. And so they, yeah, they, they take the sugars and they break them down through a series of steps that release energy and also eventually end up releasing uh, carbon dioxide and ethanol mm-hmm. as, as the, uh, the byproducts. And, and there are certain things that we can do to modify the performance of the yeast during the fermentation. Uh, there's things that the yeast needs uh, to be healthy and to do its job properly and, and not produce a bunch of uh, bad tasting off flavors. Uh, there's, it's, it's, it's useful for it to have a proper amount of oxygen, especially if you're doing a higher gravity fermentation. And uh, it's got to have nutrients. But do we have to worry about uh, nutrients, yeast nutrients, in a wort fermentation? Well, I mean, the nice thing about modern beer yeast is that they've been used, you know, generation after generation after generation to ferment beer and uh, or ferment wort into beer. And, you know, the ones that had the most finicky sort of nutritional requirements, uh, you know, got cast aside because brewers wanted something that consistently fermented you know the their substrate so um most uh most beer yeast these days if you've got an all grain uh wort if you've you know you, you've crushed some malted grains and, and made your wort you know straight uh from 100 percent malt most yeast strains are going to be good with that and don't really need much help if, you, if you've added a lot of adjuncts uh a little bit of help uh but you know, by adding um, yeast nutrients can help, and also just uh, you know, if you just want to give your yeast like an extra kick, uh, you know, you can you can add some uh, when when you pitch, uh, just a sort of a, a prophylactic measure. But but generally, uh, with most worts, you know, especially a wort that's made, you know, all or mostly from grains. Uh, most yeast strains these days work pretty well without yeast nutrients. And what about oxygen? Um, what if we don't? What if the the yeast don't have enough oxygen uh, to work with? I mean, how how can that be detrimental to them? Yeah, there's um, the yeast need oxygen because they they take that in and they use it to build these molecules called sterols, which help with the cell membrane flexibility. And um, and so it allows them essentially to to replicate because uh, they they keep they add these to the, their cell wall and um, um anyway so they need some oxygen and it's interesting um they they do save some or or they can if if they've been raised in a, uh, an environment with a lot of oxygen uh, they they do build up little stores of, of uh, molecules containing oxygen that they can use, but generally most brewers, um, you know, because you, you've grown the uh, the yeast, you're going to use up in a in a yeast brink or a or in a for a home brewer a yeast starter. Um, you're going to want to add a, add some oxygen uh, at the time of pitching because then the yeast will get it right when they need it. And most strains need about eight to ten parts per million of oxygen, uh, which it's hard to, to measure because a lot of, you know, like dissolved oxygen meters are uh, not common in home brewing. I mean, they're getting more common because the price is coming down. But, you know, most people just sort of uh, wing it. You know, like I use one of those, you know, those little uh, red cylinders of oxygen and a, and a, a regulator at going through like a, a, a sintered yeast stone uh, or sintered uh, stainless steel aeration stone. And I just, I usually do like a, a minute of pure oxygen. And I, I just know by, by trial and error at the, at the rate that I, you know, make bubbles and a minute that that usually does it well. So, you know, other people need to, you know, you need to experiment and come up with that. But yeah, yeast need oxygen. And what happens if they don't get enough, it generally is they just have to work a little bit harder to, uh, to get up to uh, fermentation strength and the fermentation will be a little weaker. Uh, it'll probably kick off more esters and uh, and or whatever else that that yeast strain normally kicks off. So it's just um, whereas yeast nutrients are kind of, least nutrients are kind of optional. You really should uh, aerate your work thoroughly 
uh, every time. And I'm, I'm usually lazy. And if it's a moderate gravity uh, five-gallon batch, I'll just shake the bucket, you know, or shake the fermenter, you know, for a couple of minutes and, and make sure that there's, you know, air in, into, the, uh, into the wort. Uh, and I know, and I know that's that's probably not the best case scenario. <laughs> but if you if you pitch enough yeast, uh, that alleviates some of the demand for oxygen, right? Yeah, it's all um, there. There's multiple factors. There's your pitching rate, uh, and then you know the aeration. Uh, there's also you know yeast nutrients, and you know if you're uh, and there's also larger oxygen demand for higher uh, gravity warts. So, you know, if you're doing a low gravity one, you can get away with a lot. You know, a lot of some people used to just, uh, when they cooled their wort, uh, the tube, they'd run into a bucket fermenter and just have the, the wort sort of fan out on the side of the bucket as it went into the bottom. And, you know, that was good for some aeration. And then shaking, yeah. Um, the, the best case, though, is to either use pure oxygen, you know, and pump it through an aeration stone or uh, use an aquarium pump and like have a, uh, put a HEPA filter in between the pump and the aeration stone. And usually like, uh, I don't know, seven, eight minutes of, uh, you know, aquarium pump on low should do it. And then I always swirl the carboy as, as I add either the air or the, or the, the gas um, just to, just to help it mm-hmm. get get mixed in faster. And I also like, um, use there, there's di- different sizes. I try to use the smallest of, of the commonly available sizes of, of, you know, pore size in the aeration stone to make smaller bubbles. And then I also turn, turn the flow down to the point where it's not like, like big bubbles aren't coming out because all, all a big bubble does is, you know, it just floats to the top and pops and then that's, that's gone. Um, you know, uh, but I, I try to get the littlest bubbles possible and swirl the carboy. And then I just sort of look at the top and I want the top to be sort of when the when the bubbles reach the top, you sort of see it, you know, um, you know, you see the top churn a bit, but not really a lot of gas breaking out. You know, I'm to, I, I, you know, want to get everything into solution, not just have it float up through solution. Right. Now, we're talking about recipe development. And so. Uh, knowing that uh, yeast is going to be uh, really important in obviously fermenting the beer, but also in adding the flavors uh, that we want, uh, what what criteria do we look for uh, in choosing different yeasts when we are uh, brewing for a particular beer or a, or a particular style? Yeah, you want to you want to have some idea of, of what your yeast is, is going to bring to the, uh, the beer. Like obviously if you're brewing, um, uh, a clean ale, you know, what you want from your yeast is different than if you're brewing a, you know, an estuary ale or a lager or a, or a German wheat beer. So you, you have to sort of know what the characteristics are that you want are. And then you have to know, you know, the yeast strains that can bring you that. And there's most types of beer that there's, there's multiple ones. And then, thirdly, you need to know that you can alter those characteristics to some to, to some extent by all you know the, the things we just talked about: uh, raising your pitching rate, lowering your pitching rate, uh, more or less aeration, uh, temperature, and those sorts of things. So, yeah, you it starts with picking the right strain, and then it's how you treat that strain during formulate or during uh, fermentation that uh, you know hopefully brings out the best. In that strain, or, or at least makes it perform in the way you want to. And different yeast strains have different alcohol tolerances. If you're brewing a big old barley wine, you want to make sure that you, that you have one that doesn't peter out before it reaches the gravity that you're wanting to. Yeah, it's interesting. Most most modern uh, brewing strains that that you can buy have a pretty high tolerance to alcohol. Most most yeast will, will get up to about twelve percent. And then you can, you know, you can do do things to to boost that a little bit. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to if you're brewing like a, a very strong Belgian beer, or or you know some sort of experimental beer that's uh, high in alcohol. You definitely want to you know 
take a look and, and see if that strain has been used, uh, you know, has a high alcohol tolerance and has been used to, to uh, ferment uh, other, you know, high alcohol beers. And you can you can manipulate that a bit. I mean, if you say mash at a lower temperature and produce more for, uh, more fermentable sugars. Uh, as opposed to mashing at a higher temperature when you've got some sugars that are or some you know some some sugars that aren't as fermentable uh, for the yeast so you can manipulate where that where that yeast ends up in the in the end yeah you can you can manipulate the fermentability of your wort so that you um, uh, if you want to say if you want to brew a a very high alcohol beer you can sort of make a wort in the normal way and just the ordinary level of attenuation is going to be such that the final gravity is fairly high, that there's, you know, that percentage of uh, unfermented carbohydrates that in a, you know, in a pale ale yield, uh, you know, a moderately full bodied beer in a, in a huge barley wine are going to yield, you know, a very definitely a, like a, a beer with a sweet edge. So you can, uh, you can mash for a higher fermentability so that you start out at, at the same high original gravity, but you, ferment down to a lower uh, final gravity. And um, that, you know, not only gives you more alcohol because you fermented through more of the wort, it gives you uh, a somewhat drier beer, even though it, even though it's very strong. And we talk about attenuation, and that is the, basically the ability for the yeast to ferment sugars down to a certain gravity. Um, and that that doesn't necessarily have to do with alcohol tolerance, right? I mean, you can have a moderate gravity wort, and you can have different yeast strains, and each one of those may ferment the beer down to uh, a different final gravity, right? And but that, but it, but it's not necessarily about alcohol tolerance because there's not a, it's below that threshold. Is that right? Right. Right. Yeah. You can take uh, let's say you brew ten pale ales in a row, and they're all you know, uh, 12 Plato or, you know, 1048, uh, specific gravity. Um, so that's not stressing at all to the yeast. If you pitch, you know, 10 different ale yeast strains and they're all treated in the same fashion, you know, same pitching rate, same uh, aeration, same, uh, same fermentation temperature. Some are going to just naturally ferment lower than others. They're just going to keep working on sugars where others are going to get to a point where they, they just say, you know, done and, uh, flocculate out. Uh, so those are called yeah. lazy, <laughs> lazy. Well, those are, uh, I mean, like why yeast 1968, the Fuller's yeast strain is that way. It, it quits a little bit early and that's, that's nice if you're wanting to brew a beer with a little more body and a little sweetness. Uh, but then there's, uh, and I think that's W L P O O two in the white labs range. And, uh, then there's the, you know, the quote unquote Chico yeast, which is, like why yeast? It's why yeast one. I can't remember. I think it's the first one. An imperial flagship. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I don't know the newer yeast companies as well. Like I lots of stuff, but yeah. And it's 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 whatever. It's the Chico ale. That that you know that same yeast. If you were to do that side by side with the, the you know quote unquote Fuller's yeast, that one's that one's going to have more attenuation. It's just going to ferment to a to a lower or final gravity and get a drier beer. And yeah, and then, and that's not. None of that is related to the alcohol tolerance because I think both of those are reasonably alcohol tolerant beers. And that's or, just and that's just <laughs> genetics, right? I mean, that's just the programming of the of the yeast. Yeah, it's just where their cutoff uh, valve is uh, not, not a literal valve, but they're <laughs> you know they're they're cut off for how much uh, you know uh, are they willing to keep you know chugging away at uh, at carbohydrates in the wort, and at what point do they you know, think, quote unquote, uh, you know, it's time to shut down now and just wait for the next batch of sugar. Yeah, it's easy to anthrop anthropomorphize things and <laughs> think that the yeast are thinking these things, but they... easy to do and fun as well. <laughs> I've got a couple of fun things to talk about from our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly from Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont. First off, Buckland Mead is now available to order on Groenfell.com. It's set to start shipping next week. Buckland is made from wildflower honey, fresh lemon, and green rooibos tea. And at only 4.8% ABV, Buckland may be 
the world's most refreshing mead. Great for summertime, summertime drinking. And, and there's a big, beautiful, handmade spring and summer seasonal collector's stein on Groenfell.com now, too. It's, it's brand new, and this thing is really cool. It's 20 ounces and designed by Autumn at Singing Dog Visual Arts. And you really have to go to Groenfell.com to check this thing out. It's be- big and beautiful. You can also find a wide variety of delicious honey-based beverages from the sessionable to higher ABV meads, perfect for pairing with a feast with family and or friends. Check it all out at family-owned and operated Groenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Along with attenuation, there's flocculation, too. Yeah, flocculation is another uh, uh, important uh, deciding factor in a yeast. Not maybe so much for recipe formulation, but in just in general, uh, you know, certainly for your process, because a highly flocculent yeast is going to drop out. Uh, and again, the, the, the fuller strain that we were just discussing, very highly flocculent, and that's part of its attenuation deal is that it starts dropping out uh, when there's still sugars that other yeast strains can get at. And then uh, in contrast, the, the Chico strain we we're talking about is the exact opposite. That stays pretty powdery. That stays in solution longer and, and is less uh, d- takes longer to, to drop out and, and drops out less, less hard. Yeah, and it's fun to watch, you know, different different yeast strains, especially if you got like a glass carboy or somewhere you can see see what's going on. Is yeah, some some yeast strains they just it just takes forever for them to fall out to clear out. And in other words, they just they're done. They just drop like a rock. <laughs> yeah, and some are like you know the the wort just becomes uniformly cloudy, and in others that it the wort stays largely clear, and then these the sort of big mats of yeast sort of churn up and down through it and ferment the beer. Yeah, it, it's it, it's interesting if you've got a, a glass carboy and a way to observe your fermentation when it's going on. There's there's a lot of interesting things to be seen in different yeast strains. It's like a lava lamp or a snow globe kind of effect. You just, uh, you know, I get mesmerized by by watching the beer ferment. You know, there's also there's also a self congratulatory uh, uh, function of that as well. It's like, hey, I did it. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so we're going to talk mo- mostly about Saccharomyces, uh, and there are there are sort of two two ish main categories of Saccharomyces yeast, right? Yeah, there's a uh, for brewers um, like functionally, there's ale yeast and lager yeast. And that's that takes care of most of the beers uh, that are brewed. Uh, there are other, like you said, there are non-saccharomyces. Like you, you can brew a beer with all Britannomyces, but f- for the most part, like most beers, certainly most beers that you would get on the shelf, uh, um, are 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 either an ale or, or a lager. And then there, you know, if you there are, there are craft breweries that make uh, specialty beers with with weird oddball yeasts but uh. <laughs> i mean you can we've done uh primary fermentations with britannomyces uh, before and it and it gives different characteristics from if you were to add it say you know like in a barrel or in secondary fermentation uh, it seems to do you know produce different uh, flavor characteristics um and and there are different strains of britannomyces as well sure yeah the, and there i mean people are are you know, experiment, experimenting with that. And I mean, I remember one of the first, I was at one of the NHCs and, and it was the, I th- the first conference I, I think they ever had on all Britannomyces beer. And when they handed them out at first, I, I thought like, oh my God, this is going to be terrible. <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, I, I was used to Brett being the, you know, the sort of thing that added a little bit of diacetyl and and, and and the barnyardy thing that happens when it when it's a contaminant at a low uh, concentration and in, in work, but turns out if you pitch a lot of it, like a full pitch of it, uh, the fermentation characteristics are a lot different. And I mean, I remember that first the all the first all Brett beer I had was very like banana astery, hmm. but but I mean it was nice and it, it had some other weird uh, not weird but it had some other. Uh, 
other fruits uh, other than banana in it. I would, I would say like there was a little tropical fruit edge to it or whatever. And it was interesting. And then, you know, since then people have done a lot of experiment experimentation with, with uh, non Saccharomyces yeast and, you know, there's still Saccharomyces still does exactly what you wanted beer and it's had centuries to do it. So uh, yeah, Brett hasn't quite caught up, but you know, we'll see. Yeah. And, and I think the first time that we had a, uh, Hundred percent Brett beer. Mike Tonsmeyer sent it uh, back when he was a home brewer, and I remember pineapple as being the the dominant flavor uh, characteristic of that. And we were just amazed at how delicious and fruity and clean and not funky it was. Um, so yeah, it's another it's another option. Um, now, but 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 back to the ordin- ordinary quote unquote uh, say ale uh, strains for Saccharomyces. Uh, they like it a little bit warmer, and do we do we know why they they like it a little bit uh, warmer than the lager their lager cousins? Well, I mean the the ale yeast run run the sort of gamut, you know. With the uh, you can you can run them colder, you can ferment colder, and they they sort of many strains at least approach a lager like level of cleanness. And then of course there's certain strains like the Kavike strains. Or Kavik strains that uh, you know you can you can ferment at, at just incredibly high temperatures and and they produce uh, you know for for the temperature very clean beers but yeah um, I mean I think basically uh, ordinary yeast strains the the typical fermentation range that that we run them in it's it's lower than the yeast like but it produces uh, a level of esters and, and other fermentation by, byproducts that uh, that beer brewers like. You know, um, you, the, the yeast is going to be happier. Uh, typically, ale yeast would be happier fermenting at 90, uh, but it's going to produce a beer that would uh, would be undrinkable, at least for most uh, most average ale strains. And then lager strains ferment colder because they're a hybrid between two different uh, between an ale strain and another ale strain, uh, hmm. that there was a non-beer brewing ale strain, and, and that actually happened in a brewery, uh, brewing lager beers, and so it adapted itself to the cold, and um, you know, because uh, because ales the old ales had been around forever, and and lagers arose sort of within well, I guess they both arose within the span of human. <laughs> species, but the, the ale much earlier in the human species than than lagers, and and and, and they're just they're they're cold adapted, and I, I don't beyond beyond that I don't really know the actual mechanisms, uh, but I mean a big part of it is it was, would be just you know uh, you know basically trial and error just keep you know lager breweries kept you know pushing to, to brew colder and colder because they got results they liked. And if a batch didn't work, well, that yeast got thrown, and they, you know, replaced it with 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 a, a yeast that would. And then, whereas ordinary ale strains were, you know, um, likewise, there was the typical fermentation range, and and the ones that that produced the best performance at those strains that were kept, and the ones that that couldn't produce a good beer at that were were booted, and you know, it's just uh, generation after generation of natural selection. And we've we've taken part in sci- in experiments uh, with the uh, brewlosophy folks, uh, mm-hmm. where they <clears throat> where they fermented a a beer with the lager uh, yeast strain, <clears throat> and they fermented it at typically you know quote unquote lager temperatures, and at ale temperatures, and the actual you know difference between those beers was you know statistically imperceptible you know so it. Uh, in at least some some circumstances, you know, temperature on on the lager yeast side makes less difference from uh, from what we have grown to expect over the years. Uh, so, and that may depend on the on the strain and the kind and the type of beer and things like that. Um, so, you know, maybe you know within a certain temperature range, maybe you know the temperature range doesn't make as as much of a difference as we thought it did in the past. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I would say that's a very strain by strain 
uh, characteristic because you know like the old uh, the old saying with uh, you know just ordinary ale yeast is that the warmer you fermented them, the more sort of the banana esters and, and things came out. And there are some British brewing strains that you know you can very much see that if you brew one at uh, say 65 and one at, at 70. Uh, those are going to be two very, very different beers. You know, the the amount of esters just ramps up w- with temperature quickly. But then you've got strains like the Chico strain, where if you do 65 and 70, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Even if you crank it up to 80, you know, which most people don't, but you, you can do it. I've done it accidentally. And uh, yeah. it still brews a beer that, that basically tastes like it's fermented with 1056. Mm-hmm. You know, so some... Some strains are more responsive to changes in temperature uh, with regards to the uh, the fermentation characteristics that kick off than others, and that's interesting about the 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 lager strains because I always I had always heard that the if you ferment lager strains warmer they they tended to get just sort of get ale like I mean in general clean ale like mm-hmm. but um, yeah that's interesting that they could could ferment uh, a lager at ale temperature and get the same performance. Yeah, we took part in, you know, they do triangle tests, you know, blind mm-hmm. triangle tests. And, you know, of course, I don't have the most accurate palate in the world, but <laughs> but I couldn't tell the difference. And neither could Steve. Uh, I suspect the two of you have drank some beer in your life. So I <laughs> I try I trust your taste buds. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if that's that's an advantage or a disadvantage, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. yeah, it, it we, better be an advantage or I'm in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> You've lost that newbie edge. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you could say that. (laughs) You've been around the block, (laughs) and that block has a lot of bars in it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, so a German a German wheat uh, beer yeast is a really good example at at looking at how uh, you can. use a yeast in your recipe formulation and use these techniques that we're talking about to modify the flavor characteristics that that yeast puts out, right? I mean, that's it may be one of the most um, not easily manipulatable, but, but it, it is probably one of the strains where if you change the parameters, you will – see a noticeable difference right i mean what are the, what are the uh what are the things that you can do parameters that you can change techniques that you can use in say doing a german hefeweizen uh to bring either the you know the most out of the yeast or to suppress it i mean what what things when you're designing a recipe uh and using that yeast uh, what are some things that you can think about yeah, German uh, wheat yeast strains, which are, which are uh, a subset of ales, are interesting because they show you it shows you the importance of strain selection. Like if you wanted to brew a Hefeweizen and all you had was ordinary like British ale strains, you, you, there's no manipulation you could do to those to, to get them to produce like a Hefeweizen strain. So it is the, the strain selection that does that. But then once you start brewing uh, with uh, you know a German wheat strain. There's there's two major characteristics. Um, there's uh, uh, banana esters that's part of their their profile, and there's uh, cloves which are phenolics. And uh, additionally, some strains have like a like a bubblegum characteristic to them. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing is that as you uh, as you raise the temperature or or also lower the pitching rate, uh, the amount of those go up. But the rate of ester formation actually increases more with with rising temperature than clove formation. So what you get is at higher and higher temperatures, you get uh, more and more banana-y strains. And then there's, there's, there's also strains that are balanced more one way or the other. And, and then, of course, there, there's pitching rate uh, varies, too. If you, if you made a, a, a German wheat beer with a... Uh, you know, let's say you doubled your normal pitching rate and fermented at, at you know the cold end of the range, it's going to be overall that'd be a clove-like uh, beer uh, and very low overall characteristics, uh, you know, uh, of the of the wheat beer sort of aromas and stuff. On the other hand, if you halved the pitching rate and fermented it at the uh, sort of top end of that range, 
you'd get a very banana astry uh uh, wheat beer with you know you'd still be able to taste the clove but it would be sort of mostly overpowered by the uh, um, uh, by the the bananas and so yeah it's, it's interesting well there you've got sort of a multi-way puzzle to solve if you've got a very specific uh, ester phenol or you know yeah yeah ester phenol or, or banana clove balance that you want you've got to pick the right strain then you've got to uh, pick the right temperature to ferment it, and you've got a, 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 a pitching rate. There is, you know, and all three of those things play a role. And so, yeah, that's. I used to, I used to brew German wheat beers quite a bit, and it was, it was fun, and also sometimes frustrating trying to get, you know, a profile uh, that I really liked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I'm, I've I've rarely brewed a, a German wheat beer that that I liked or that it came out the way I was expecting it to. <laughs> it's just it was kind of frustrating to me. This past weekend, Susan and I got to spend time with Desiree and Dave of HighGravityBrew.com in Tulsa. We went to see Ellis Costello in concert at Kane's Ballroom. It was incredible. <laughs> but before we before the show. We stopped by Pippin's Tap Room at High Gravity, and I got a flight that included Center of the Universe, uh, no T in that, Center of the Universe Midwest IPA, Doc Brown Imperial Brown Ale, and This Aggression Will Not Stand Man, which is a light-colored milk stout. That has a T, stout, inspired by (laughs) the white Russian cocktail enjoyed by a certain on-screen dude. And after that flight... I got a full pint of the This Aggression Will Not Stand Man because it was so good. And I'm just, you know, trying to – my taste buds are kind of in conflict with my eyes, you know, because I'm tasting a milk stout, but I'm seeing this lighter colored beer. Anyway, the good news is that all of these beers are available as kits on HighGravityBrew.com. That's right. Not only is HighGravityBrew.com the place for excellent warthog brewing gear, you can find recipe kits that have been – Customer proven at Pippin's Tap Room, so you know they're good. And if you want to pick up some Warthog Electric gear while you're at it, use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your Warthog purchase. Show our friends some support as they've supported this show for many, many years. That's at family owned and operated highgravitybrew.com. That's highgravitybrew.com. But uh, but Belgian strains are also uh, very manipulatable. Uh, <laughs> I need to pick smaller words. <laughs> but they, but but uh, Belgian yeast strains are also known for their uh, flavorful characteristics as well. Yeah, it's interesting if you if you were to draw like a, a Venn diagram that covered like a flavor and aroma of ordinary yeast strains, that would be like a. You know, that'd be, you know, like a softball size uh, circle in the middle. And then German wheat beer strains would be a, a much smaller circle, like uh, just off the, like bubbling off that. Uh, but if you were to draw, you know, in the Venn diagram, uh, Belgian yeast strains, it would be like a huge circle that sort of halfway encompassed, uh, you know, the ordinary yeast strains. Because uh, there's just a lot of different idi- idiosyncratic yeast among them and their and the, the their performance is is very variable like i remember there was this uh well, still is uh, a brew pub in austin and they were making uh uh this this ipa at one point and my friends were like oh you got to try this and i tried it and i was like hey it's a good it's a good ipa you know the straight up west coast style and then they said try to guess the yeast strain that this was and, and i was like you know i don't know 1056 and they were like no it's the, they were using the whatever the west mall hmm. uh triple strain was wow and and, and you know I normally I, th- I think of that as you know the triples have a have a, that uh there's a distinctive phenolic characteristic to that and uh but what they did was what the brewers did uh, there is they just they found out uh i don't know by trial and error or someone told them that if you just up the pitching rate of that yeast it, it makes a very clean ale yeast, hmm. and it uh, it's also a high. It, it has a high alcohol tolerance, and it's a it's a workhorse yeast. I mean, it really you know at a brew pub you want it, you don't want your tanks tied up forever. You want them to uh, 
so they could they could go with a relatively high pitching rate, relatively normal uh, uh, fermentation temperature, and that that strain which they were using in other beers uh, uh, worked well to make a clean ale. Hmm. And then and then of course if you you take that same yeast and you slightly underpitch it and ferment it at a fairly warm temperature, not not ludicrously, you know it gives you that nice uh, triple style of uh, beer. Hmm. And, and a lot of Belgian strains are like that. They're very, they're very idiosyncratic. And, and additionally, some, uh, just like normal ale strains, some are very sensitive to the conditions and other, others not so much. You know, others you can do whatever you want. And they, you know, like my experience with the, uh, with the, the Chimay like strains are that they, over, over a reasonable spectrum of, you know, fermentation pitching rate, uh, you know, or temperature and pitching rate yield this, roughly the same kind of beer, you know. Uh, but yeah, uh, the others are, you know, more, more manipulatable. <laughs> now you, That's contagious. Mani- manipulatable. So on lager, on the lager side, if you're, if you're fermenting, you know, in the comfort zone for lagers to ferment cleanly, is it less uh, critical, you know, which lager yeast strain you choose? Are they all similar in that way? Uh, to me, yeah, the similarity of lager yeast is high. There's, you know, if we went back to the Venn diagram, that would be the smallest, you know, sort of circle if you're using ordinary, you know, because they're all, all meant to be, you know, uh, clean, you know, quote unquote, clean fermentation pro- profile. And, and lagers are, you know, there's there's some difference, and some are uh, have more attenuation than others. But lagers are, are basically on the edged a little bit towards the dry side. And yeah, you know, if you pitched at the, the normal rates and pitched at uh, or fermented at the normal rates, there's there's less variation in in the performance of lager yeast than there is in you know ale strains. And certainly, if you pick, you know, uh, sort of. A clean ale strain and a, and, a, and a very British ale strain, and then a, you know, uh, German wheat beer and another like uh, funky uh, Belgian style. Yeah, and do, you know, four beers that way, you're going to get four very different beers. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you pick four of the most popular lager yeast styles and ferment them all, you know, they're going to taste like four lagers. You know. <laughs> and there's some there's some sort of uh, new experimental. Uh, yeast strains out there that I've heard about. I haven't used myself, but there's like a uh, some genetically modified yeast out there that uh, apparently um, accentuates some of the hop characteristics. Say, if you're making like a, a hazy, you know, New England IPA, apparently that that is you know one yeast strain that uh, that people are turning to. Uh, and also, I've heard of another one recently that. Uh, is really kind of poor at at fermenting alcohol so that you could, uh, you know, do like a, a wort with, a, you know, like 10, 20 starting gravity and f- ferment it with that yeast and get a low alcohol beer, uh, you know, that, that has, a, you know, nice body and, and flavor characteristics. Uh, so there there's still some new stuff uh, coming out nowadays. So, you know, uh, just keep your ears open, and and there's there's lots of stuff to play with out there. Yeah, I, I've heard about these strains, although that was like 15 minutes ago, right before we, when you were <laughs> you were telling me about it right before the show. And why don't we add these things? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> and that's and we've reached the extent of our knowledge on those. So <laughs> I, I, I've actually read a tiny tiny bit on the uh, the alcohol free ones, and those are that's becoming an interesting segment among. Uh, in uh, brewing, because not only are those beers typically, uh, you know, very very low alcohol, but they're also low in calories, and so, you know, it can, it can be an answer for for brewers who want to come up with a, a low calorie beer that's still, um, like, do you remember the like O'Doul's and all those old school yeah. like alcohol free? Oh, those were just disgusting. Yeah, they were bad. <laughs> I, I I guess I mean I've heard that the the newer ones taste more like actual beer, so I, I would be interested in trying one of those and then even you know trying to ferment one of those if I could get a, my hands on the, the yeast string. 
Yeah, I, I, <laughs> a friend of mine, when O'Doul's first came out, uh, he went to like an Oktoberfest uh, thing uh, with a bunch of his friends, and they all pooled their money, and he stood in line to get pitchers of beer. And he said, I got this new beer. It's called O'Doul's. And they were <laughs> like, what, you idiots? <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. And for some reason, he thought O'Doul's would be appropriate for Oktoberfest, too. So. Oktoberfest. Yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, now, we we're, we didn't talk about it, and we're, we may not talk about much, uh, other microbes that you can put into your beer. I mean, there's also the Britannomyces, which is a yeast, but there's also, uh, and, and Kvike, or Kvik, or Kvik, or yeah, pick, pick one of those. It's a choose your own destiny kind of thing. But uh, there's also um, Lactobacillus, you know, Pediococcus, uh, Mycococcus. No, wait, that's something else. Uh, but the, there are these other microbes that you can put in your beer to uh, also uh, change the flavor characteristics, you know, change the fermentation profile. Uh, so, there, you know, there are other bugs in the toolkit, so to speak. Yeah, all the uh, – all... All the classic sort of sour beers were made with some sort of lactic acid bacteria, either uh, uh, one of the, the many species of lactobacillus or sometimes with some pediococcus uh, thrown in. And then also these, some of those were mixed fermentations. And, and there was also Britannomyces in there, which, which didn't contribute sourness, but that, you know, overall added some complexity to the beverage. And yeah, um, they've, I mean, people have even tried fermenting a beer like entirely with with like lacto mm. and uh it's just i mean that's just gonna turn out like idiotically sour um <laughs> and depending on the strain yeah you, who knows what's what else is, is it's in there because there's there, there's strains of that are hetero fermentate hetero fermentative and homo fermentative strains and, and some of them just sort of straight ferment and others ferment and also give off some other stuff. But yeah, their bacteria is used in mixed cultures in, in a lot of sour beer brewing and, uh, and can be, can even be used as you know, uh, to kettle sour beers and it can be used. It can be pitched at a, at a very high rate, uh, such as in, uh, German Berliner Weisses, you know, they, they culture the, you know, they, they don't just let it sour the beer in barrels or, or anything like that. With a small amount of contamination, they uh, grow, uh, you know, starters essentially of of, of the lactobacillus and, and pitch it at a relatively high rate. Yeah, and and, and of course, uh, you can you can you can harvest your own yeast. Put your put a pan of wort outside under a bush or something, or under an apple tree, or you know, uh, use caution when doing so. But uh, but you know, people are harvesting their own yeast and and using it to, to ferment beer and you know, start starting their own thing. Yeah, if you uh, if you live anywhere near where, where fruit is being grown, you can you can take some wort out, and you can uh, if if you want to get just beer yeast or, or not beer yeast, but Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, which is common in the wild, uh, lower the pH of the wort to like 4.5 or something. It doesn't have to be that low, but that's going to make sure that whatever grows is is capable of growing at a, at a lower pH, which is required for beer. And then make the uh, make the word just... Uh, it can be very low gravity, but but enough so that the alcohol gets like up to at least like 1%, because by that time, uh, almost everything else is going to die off except for... Uh, brewer's yeast and uh, and lactic acid bacteria, and so you you can yeah you can do some selection, uh, or you know you harvest strains from the wild and then do some selection, uh, you know uh, if you if you know actual microbiological techniques you could you know plate them out and then pick colonies and grow grow up individual tubes and and try out the fermentation and then you know that your biggest problem would be most of them would have the uh, what's it called the POF uh, plus or minus, I can't remember. I don't know. The, <laughs> you've, yeah, so you've, phenolic stumped, off, you've stumped the host. <laughs> phenolic off flavor. So if it was POF plus, then they'd have some weird uh, phenolic uh, flavor in it. You'd, but you you could probably eventually find enough strains that had a, a where it's POF minus or or 
some other set of characteristics offset whatever phenolics it was giving off or maybe you like them and yeah so you can uh yeah you can harvest your own saccharomyces from nature it's just uh it's a lot easier to go to the beer store (laughs) homebrew shop well there you go thanks chris well thanks again to chris i think we're going to start actually putting some recipes together using the information that we've learned in the recipe development series. So that should be a lot of fun to see how that works. What styles would you like us to tackle as we start doing that kind of stuff? If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Uh, thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dutz. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.